Idly ho, neighborinos. It's been a minute since we talked about the Twisted Metal timeline, the ever-ambiguous sequence of events that tie these games together, which may or may not have been an intentional thing created, or just me grasping at straws. Last time I did an overview of the Twisted Metal timeline as I saw it, I was a bit sloppy. I wasn't quite as familiar with the Twisted Metal series as I am now, and as such missed some details which flesh out the timeline much more. So quite frankly, I'm not happy with how I did that video in hindsight. I did as good of a job as I could for the time, but this time I need to do it right. So join me as we attempt to connect the dots that were never meant to be connected. Before we start, if you like what I do, please consider pledging to my Patreon for unique perks and rewards. At $1, you get ad-free viewing, as well as your name in the credits. At $5, you get early access, as well as Discord benefits. And at $10, you get a verbal shout-out and exclusive content, including my short-form review series where I take a look at the wild, wacky, and obscure side of the PS1's library I've dubbed the PSX Files. Enough shilling, onto the video. First of all, I'm going to establish three separate options for a game's canonicity. Hard canon, soft canon, and alternate canon. Hard canon refers to something that is definitively canon. There's no ambiguity, we know exactly where this game stands in the larger canon of the Twisted Metal franchise. Soft canon is where we have a good idea, but there is some ambiguity. Maybe there's no specific chain of events that led into the game, maybe the game doesn't have a definitive timeline placement, Maybe the game is only implied to have taken place after the previous game, but with no confirming evidence. Whatever the case, soft canon means something that has a level of ambiguity. Then there's alternate canon. Now, originally I was going to put non-canon, but I don't think that's fair because technically everything happens in the Twisted Metal universe just in different timelines or continuities. How do I know this? Well, the last time I discussed the Twisted Metal timeline, I came to that conclusion while looking over the trophy showcase in Twisted Metal 2012. You know, when they do a panning shot of Calypso's office, which had various mementos from throughout the series. Twisted Metal 2012, I remind you, being a reboot, so he couldn't have just had those mementos. So the idea that he took trophies from all of his victims from throughout the series said to me that he was a multi-dimensional being. Now, I've since come to the conclusion that he might not actually simply be just a multi-dimensional being, but rather, since he's shown that he has the power to warp space-time at will, he might actually be a singular entity, one that basically just rewrites the universe whenever he gets bored. I'll explain more when we get there. It's kind of hard to have a concrete continuity when the subject of the series is essentially a godlike being, but we'll try our best. I'm also going to be moving in the order of the games as they appear in the timeline, rather than going by release order. So let us start with the best place to start, that of course being the start. So the story begins all the way back in 1956 or 57. The specifics aren't known, but sometime between 1956 and 57, Calypso was born allegedly named William Sparks. This is the anchor for the series because it establishes the beginning point of the main timeline. Then in 1968, at the age of 12, Calypso begins his journey into darkness when he accidentally kills his own sister the first time he drives a car. Then in 1970, he kills his parents in a fiery car wreck. Following that, he spends two years as a mechanic for a demolition derby, then subsequently spends 20 years on the demolition derby circuit, which would take us all the way up to 1992. This is where the first bit of mental gymnastics comes in. So, according to Twisted Metal 2, Krista Sparks, Calypso's daughter who appears in this prequel comic, is 15 at the time of the tournament in Twisted Metal 2. And this is during the 11th annual Twisted Metal tournament in 2006. So if we're on the 11th tournament and the first Twisted Metal tournament was held in 1996, Krista would have had to have been born in 1991. Although I've never been good at math. Meaning there would have had to have been a second unsaid time jump between the point in which he says he was on the circuit for 20 years and his eventual death, because otherwise Krista would have been one year old here. But if the first tournament is held on Christmas Eve 1996, Christmas Eve being the traditional day the tournament is held on according to the first game, that means depending on when Calypso crashed his car, she could be upwards of four or five years old. She looks like she could be as old as 12 here, but it's not unreasonable to say she looks older than she actually is. Now, I know this picture has the number six on it, and if that is her age, that super doesn't line up with any possible timeline, so I'm just going to ignore it. 
But we also know that she was reanimated and fitted with a bomb by the NYPD in order to take out Calypso, and if she was dead for a few years, that means she wouldn't have aged in that time, and maybe she was starting to age again once she was revived. But that's a bunch of wild theory with no real basis. And the onus is on the game to show us that, rather than use theory as fact, especially when there's already a perfectly fine explanation without all that theory. I mean, if Krista spent a couple of years as a corpse and had to be rebuilt, she'd either be mostly long-term corpse or mostly robot. So she'd either look more like a corpse or look more like a robot. Meaning to me, having Krista's age be a linear line would make the most sense until proven otherwise. So inserting my own headcanon into this, I'm gonna say that there was an unsaid time jump, and this scene takes place somewhere in early to mid-1996. That way you can suspend your disbelief over Krista being young enough to only be 15 years old by 2006, but also not so young that she wouldn't be able to reach the pedals in this scene. Following that, he dies, goes to hell, and Satan rewards him with Minion's power and gets him to start the tournament in order to send decent drivers to hell. You know, for entertainment purposes. Thereby setting the stage for the first Twisted Metal tournament on Christmas Eve in 1996. So the early main timeline looks something like this. So from this point forward, Minion would enter the tournament every year in hopes of getting his power back. He even wins the ninth Twisted Metal Tournament on Christmas Eve 2004, but likely had his words twisted by Calypso as he's one to do, leading Minion to not get what he wanted. Now chronologically speaking, the first game is not necessarily the first game in the timeline. The first game in the timeline might actually technically be Twisted Metal Black. I'll explain why, because it does seem like this would be an entirely separate canon at first, and while that may be true, with Minion's decoded messages, you'll find that this is a game taking place within Sweet Tooth's head. And the way I choose to interpret this is that this is a regular Twisted Metal tournament, but the entire game is shown from Sweet Tooth's perspective. His mind is twisting the characters, twisting the environments, all to his own diseased whims. This is something I've gone over multiple times, but I believe that something is going on here, even if we aren't seeing what it really is. But when does it take place? Well, there are some clues here, such as Sweet Tooth being arrested in 2001, specifically October 2001. He also said that he'd spent three months in the nut house after his arrest and failed execution. Three months in the nut house. It was the longest I'd ever been confined. Which would put us in at least 2002, but we get a cleaner indication of the timeline when we take a look at Mr. Grimm. It says he's 51, however, he says he was drafted into the army at the age of 18 to fight in Vietnam in 1971. So by doing a little bit of math, that means Twisted Metal Black takes place in 2004, or depending on when his birthday is, it could also be taking place in 2005, which means it would be taking place in the same year as the original Twisted Metal. So which would it be? Well, here's what's up. In the game, Minion is established to be the previous year's winner, the same as the original Twisted Metal, which according to Mr. Grimm's age could potentially be taking place in the same year and chronologically have the same previous winner, which comes across to me as though Twisted Metal Black is attempting to take place concurrently with Twisted Metal 95 as sort of an abstract reinterpretation both from a real-world perspective as well as an in-universe perspective. This is the original Twisted Metal as Sweet Tooth sees it. It's a bit of a stretch, but I do believe that to be true looking at it, making this sort of a soft canon parallel sequel taking place at the same time as the original game as seen through the eyes of Needles. You may ask how this ties into Sweet Tooth being caught in 2001. Well, whether or not this actually happened or if this was just some mental scenario remains a mystery, but death penalty charges usually take years to process. So it would make sense if he was sitting around for four years. Then we know from his Twisted Metal 2 bio that he spent some time in the Nut House, so three months in the Nut House before being let out to compete in the tournament isn't out of the question. So that's where I'm putting this particular pin. Twisted Metal Black happens at the same time as Twisted Metal 95. Speaking of which... This is an easy one, as it's one of the few games that tells you when it's taking place to the day. Christmas Eve 2005. The day of the 10th annual Twisted Metal Tournament. This right here is pretty well the point of reference for the entire timeline of the series, because it's so definitive. It's also one of the few games to have a definitive winner, that being Sergeant Carl Roberts, as that's the only connection to the next game. Most of the returning cars will swap their drivers for different drivers, and that's if they return at all. Pit Viper. 
Admittedly, this game is a bit of a continuity nightmare, what with the Grim Reaper having been after Calypso's soul for an extended period of time, and the source of Calypso's power being a demon from hell which Satan himself comes to repossess, when Satan himself was the one retconned to give Calypso his powers. But given the fact that this game does have a definitive winner, a lot of that can be mentally filed under the let's just pretend it didn't happen category. Incidentally, there was also an unused cutscene for the first game that said Calypso's accident was 10 years previous and he re-emerged 8 years previous. What about the accident? 10 years ago, you crashed your car directly into a brick wall. They thought you were dead. And 2 years later, you emerged and the, the high octane competition began. But that doesn't even line up with the timeline of the game that's meant to tie into, so once again, it's something you can safely ignore. Let's just say that was canon to the High Octane universe. I mean, trying to fit this all together already requires Olympic levels of mental gymnastics, so doing one more mental backflip ain't gonna hurt. And that brings us to Twisted Metal 2. This is the hard canon sequel to the first game. As I alluded to, this game takes place exactly one year later on Christmas Eve 2006, as confirmed by the opening cutscene. Exactly one year ago on Christmas Eve, my twisted metal contest destroyed the City of Angels. And Los Angeles is still on fire from the tournament in the previous year, but to be fair, at this point, being on fire is basically California's default state. Sad but true. Now, it does take a little bit of suspension of disbelief for this to take place over the course of one day, considering that, you know, you go all over the world. But to be honest, it's really not that big of a stretch considering what else happens in the series. Major updates in the timeline between games. The driver of Yellow Jacket and father of Needles Kane, Charlie Kane, has digivolved into Darktooth. Hammerhead was driven by Mike and Dave before, but now it's being driven by Mike and Stu. They might be different characters, but I choose to believe that Mike ditched Dave for Stu. And of course, the new driver of Outlaw is Jamie Roberts, sister of Carl Roberts, who after winning the tournament in the previous year, was sent to space. Of course, when we get to Twisted Metal head-on, it will become more apparent that most, if not all, the endings from Twisted Metal are canon to the Twisted Metal multiverse, but let's just ignore that for now. It's funny how the two games are so different in so many ways that this could almost be considered a reboot, much in the same way that Nintendo games are mostly standalone games, but then they throw in this one nod to continuity. But anyway, that's all there really is to say on this matter. It's a very straightforward kind of affair, but any straightforwardness leaves this franchise from this moment on, because things really start to get complicated very quickly. The next game in the timeline is Twisted Metal Head On. The original follow-up to Twisted Metal 2 was obviously 3, but that wasn't made by the original developers. Later on, most of the original developers formed a new company and decided to make a true follow-up to Twisted Metal 2 as they envisioned it, making it a hard canon sequel to 2. But there isn't any clear winner coming from the previous game in the same way that there was from 1 to 2, because there are multiple characters who, if you're playing as them, have their status in the world reflect the idea that they won the tournament in the previous game. Axel has mechanical arms, Krista Sparks and Simon Whittlebone are both dead, and so on. At the very least, they didn't try to make the more catastrophic endings canon, such as Mr. Grimm or Thumper, but it is still a little bit of a mess. It's not as cut and dry as it was before, which leads me to conclude that with a few exceptions, the true winner of the tournament in Twisted Metal 2 is the character that you select in Head On. You're kind of just working under the assumption that if you select them, this is the specific branching timeline where they won the previous contest. Assuming it's not a character that's entirely new, and that's fine by me. The canon winner is the character you chose. The end. Best I can tell, the only concrete thing that carries over from the last game is that Charlie Kane, Darktooth, is officially dead. And now Darktooth is the amalgamation of Marcus Kane and Needles Kane. But none of that answers the question of when this game takes place. We know it takes place after 2, but how long after? Well, the thing that I overlooked last time is the idea that you can get a gauge for when these games take place by looking at the age of the characters. Twisted Metal Head-On has the ages of most of the characters front and center on their bio, but unfortunately the games that came before did it. So I was kind of stumped, but then I got an idea. A lot of games of this era had a tendency to include a lot of information in the manuals that they don't include in the game. And sure enough, Captain Jamie Roberts in Twisted Metal 2 is 24 years old, and here she's 27. 
And the same goes for Marcus Kane, who was 32 in Twisted Metal 2, but 35 in Twisted Metal Head On. So that's the verdict. Twisted Metal Head On takes place three years after the second game in 2009. And boy howdy did Calypso age a lot in those three years. But I don't know, he's had a lot of different looks, so he can probably change it at will. Why he chose to look like Larry David though, that's still a mystery to me. What's funny is, placing Head On was already a bit of a challenge, but now we're at the point where all sense of logic is gone. We now have to place two games on the timeline that to my mind are part of this original run, but in a much more vague and complicated way. Next up is Twisted Metal Lost. This was the original intended follow-up to Twisted Metal Black before being canned in 2003, but it's a complete and utter mess of continuity in a series that's already an absolute crapshoot in that regard. It goes out of its way to retcon some things from Black, like the idea that John Doe isn't actually just an FBI agent, but one of a series of clones, and instead of being made to infiltrate this gang, now their main prerogative is solely to take down Calypso. Then you have the alleged rumor that Black is from a different dimension and was sent by an alternate dimension Calypso, which itself would be incongruous with either of my theories as to how the timelines work because that would imply that each alternate version of Calypso is a separate entity altogether. Plus, this game goes eight ways wacky compared to the somewhat grounded Black, like how there's the new driver introduced that's literally a headless corpse. If Black was the video game equivalent of somebody going insane, this is the video game equivalent of someone who's already gone off the deep end. It's like taking the main character of falling down in the beginning of the movie compared to the end of the movie. It's not an unreasonable assumption that the thing about Black being a game solely from the perspective of Sweet Tooth is still true in this game, except that he's only further continued to lose his mind. This is especially apparent given that his character profile doesn't actually have a story unlike the other characters. All these characters are just wild and wacky fantasies he's come up with, but Sweet Tooth in his own mind is still just Sweet Tooth, or rather Needles. Which is also how I would mentally justify the contradictions, especially the idea of all versions of Calypso being extensions of the same being and Black being sent from a different dimension. Even then, they only said it was a rumor anyway, so without a proper story to confirm or deny, we have no reason to assume it was true. The idea that Lost is taking place within Sweet Tooth's mind is also how I would mentally justify the idea that most of these character profiles are written as though the character in question won the tournament from Twisted Metal Black. I could use the explanation that the character you pick is the one who won the tournament in the previous game, but since it's all taking place in Sweet Tooth's head, I don't really need to do that. So with that, I'm gonna say this is a soft canon sequel to Head On, while also being a hard canon sequel to Black, if you see what I mean. But that begs the question, when does this take place? Well, the issue is, we have multiple points of reference. The bio for No Face says he's been collecting eyes and tongues of various people for 8 years, but Junkyard Dog says it's been 10 years. If I was a betting man, I think I would go with Junkyard Dog as the reference point because he specifically says it's been 10 years since the tournament, whereas No Face says that it's been 8 years since he started collecting the eyes and tongues of his victims. So that would lead one to assume that he went 2 years after the tournament completely fine before snapping. Though, once again, none of this might have actually happened. However, this places the game somewhere in 2015. Then there's Small Brawl. Small Brawl is an interesting case, because it's somewhere between soft canon and different canon. It's obviously incredibly different to the main series, I mean, look at it. But it also has one conspicuous connection to the main timeline that's impossible to ignore. Spectre in this game is looking for his dad, and as a prize, is given a locket with a picture of his dad who just so happens to be Ken Masters from Twisted Metal 2, that game's version of Spectre. Depending on how much stock you put in this connecting small brawl to Twisted Metal 2, this is either a definitive statement or a cute little easter egg for the people who care. But let's just roll with it. So at the time of his death in 2006 via either getting blown to smithereens in the tournament or getting his face stretched out with ellipse, Ken Masters was 32 years old, and this kid right here according to the wiki is 13 years old and also possibly named Daniel. I don't know where any of this was said, but I'll take their word for it. Though that doesn't give us much to work with. That's a range of like 2007 to 2020, because this can't take place any more than 13 years after old Ken died, but it also has to take place after he died. 
But what does give us something to work with is the idea that Little Spectre's dad was considered long lost, to the point that Little Spectre didn't even know who his dad was, meaning that Ken Masters died when Little Spectre was young enough that he has no memory of his dad, or he abandoned his family and died later on. So if we're working under the assumption that it was the former and not the latter, we're looking at a range of when this game takes place as probably 2018 to 2020. However, if Ken did abandon his family and Little Spectre simply never met his dad, then it can be as early as 2007. But he's also excited to find his dad, so he clearly doesn't have abandonment issues, meaning it's probably the former. So we're just gonna say sometime between 2018 through to 2020. I'm still not even sure if I can consider this game a soft canon sequel to Twisted Metal 2, because this obviously isn't Calypso as we knew him in the second game, and the thing is, most of these cutscenes can be explained through a combination of special effects, having connections, and cartoon logic, so in that regard, you could just say this kid is some kid who saw Demolition Derby on TV, or maybe even saw the real Twisted Metal tournament in action and decided to do his own thing, even adopting the name Calypso as a handle. This guy at the beginning of 2 yelled up at Calypso, so clearly he's a well-known enough person for people to know his name. Calypso! Calypso, what have you done? The only issue is Hammerhead's ending, which can't be explained any other way than Billy Calypso having powers, so there exists a couple of possibilities here. Either A, Calypso rewrote the universe and made a different timeline altogether and just decided to take the piss with it, with Ken Masters being worked in there somehow. B, it's a soft sequel to Twisted Metal 2 and this isn't actually the real Calypso. Just some kid playing pretend and we just ignore Hammerhead's ending. Or C, it's a sequel to Twisted Metal 4 where that kid who kinda looks like Billy Calypso grabbed the ring and is the new tournament head. I'm just gonna go full mental gymnastics and pick option B, but this is possibly the most subjective piece of the puzzle so far. And speaking of subjective, since this game doesn't tie into any future entries, there's no way to know who's the canonical winner of this game. So really, that's up for you to decide, I guess. Moving on. To me, that's the ending of Timeline A. They can still add to it if they want, but to me, that's the ending of Timeline A, and depending on how you want to interpret this, one of two things happens at this point. If we work under the assumption that Calypso is a multidimensional being, we can just assume that all these timelines are taking place simultaneously in their own little vacuums with different pieces of Calypso's consciousness. But personally, I believe that after some undisclosed point in the timeline, Calypso got bored and decided to essentially rewrite the universe, and that's where Twisted Metal 2012 takes place. Calypso probably got sick of Timeline A and had the thought, how funny would it be if I had Jeff Bezos' levels of influence, but still included some of my chums from this timeline. So next thing we know, Calypso warps reality so he's the owner of this massive corporate conglomerate and looks suspiciously like Weird Al Yankovic. But whether or not these are all linear timelines taking place one after the other, or all happening simultaneously, it doesn't really matter because the end result is the same. It's just down to your own interpretation. Now, since I'm going with the assumption that this is a different chunk of the timeline that takes place after the original timeline, why am I going with 2012 first? Why isn't it 3 and 4 in this spot? Simple. Take a look at Calypso's Trophy Showcase. You have such items as the Flight Recorder and Crazy Herald from the first game, flight tickets and a broken helmet from 2, as well as voodoo dolls and a pimped out boxing glove from Black. You know what I don't see? Anything from 3 and 4. And I know that's because the game's director, David Jaffe, didn't work on either of those games, or at least wasn't the director, and these are just trophies from all the games he's worked on, but it fits perfectly into this theory that this is a stopgap that takes place between the original timeline and the timeline that 3 and 4 take place in. Granted, that does also beg the question of how he can have items from Twisted Metal Black when that's ostensibly taking place in Sweet Tooth's head. I don't have a great answer for that. Maybe Calypso spent the weekend in Needle's head, much in the same way as Martian Manhunter trying to enter the Joker's head that one time before immediately regretting it. Maybe he found some souvenirs he liked and brought them out for his collection. I don't know, you can draw your own conclusions on that front. I mean, there's also no in-universe explanation for the Blades of Chaos being there, but that's besides the point. So when does this game take place, though? Well, 2022, of course. Because Sophie Kane died in 2012 according to her gravestone, and they specified that she'd been dead for 10 years. 
Now, you may be asking at this point, even though it's intended to be a reboot, why can't we make it our headcanon that the 2012 game takes place at the end of timeline A, rather than being its own standalone chunk of the timeline? Well, if they weren't so explicit with Needles' backstory, we could actually do that. Unfortunately, there are some details that prevent that from being the case. It's established that the Kane family were the first victims of Sweet Tooth. Sophie looked like this at the time, but looked like this at the time of her death. She doesn't look like she's aged that much at all. If we're being super generous, there may have been a one-year gap between the initial attack and her death, but if she died in 2012, that would mean the emergence of Needles was in 2011 if we're being super ultra-generous. Well, unfortunately, there are games that take place in Timeline A before 2011, so that's a retcon bridge too far for me. And since it was intended as a reboot, it's a reboot. Though if you believe that it's the game that concludes Timeline 1, then you're free to do so. All you need to do is change this one bit. As for the other things that happened in this game, I have no idea. I have no point of reference for how old Mr. Grimm was when his dad died. I have no point of reference for how long ago Dollface's accident took place. These things just happened at some unspecified point in the timeline. We do know that there were things that happened after the game, but before the timeline was reset again. What with Marcus slash Needles' son Charlie vowing to take revenge on Calypso, and Sophie Kane being resurrected as a female answer to Sweet Tooth. But since we don't have a sequel to confirm, we never saw what came of that. All we have is the assurance that Calypso lived long enough to get bored of this reboot world he made for himself, and eventually warped reality again into what would become Timeline C. This time, he evidently thought it would be fun to have the tournament start all the way back as far as the dawn of automobiles. That way, the tournament could have been running for roughly a hundred years before the modern-day renditions. Up to and including having an alternate rendition of the tournaments from Twisted Metal 1 and 2 that we never saw. Presumably, he was also getting bored with reality in general and decided to make things a lot wackier. Hence the complete and utter tone shift, which of course brings us to Twisted Metal 3. So when does Twisted Metal 3 take place? Well, here's the thing. It was originally placed as an intentional sequel to the second game, and exists as kind of an alternate version of that. I choose to believe that that was the intention of the big man himself, kind of wanting a do-over of that particular era of his existence, but through the filter of this newer, wackier universe. And much like head-on, several of these people were said to have won the tournament in the previous year if you play as them. So much like head-on, the canonical winner between 2 and 3 is simply the character you choose. So since this was originally supposed to be a sequel to 2, I don't think it's wrong to use Twisted Metal 2 as a point of reference for what year this takes place. At least that's what I thought, because there are some continuity issues here that somewhat prevent that from taking place. Most notably, how Captain Rogers says in his bio that he's 107 years old, whereas he was 105 years old in the previous game. This takes place as a definitive follow-up to the previous game, where he wished for the body of a 20-year-old, but only got the body and not the head to match. But also, one of the other returning characters is Marcus Kane, who's a sprightly 36 years old, whereas he was 32 years old in Twisted Metal 2. The problem is, if Captain Rogers has aged two years, but Marcus Kane has aged four years, that can't really coexist canonically because their birthdays can't possibly line up in such a way to have their ages like that. That's not the case with someone like Axel, who was 35 in Twisted Metal 2, but is 38 in 3. And the same goes for Bruce Cochran, who's 30 in 2, but 33 in 3. That's the thing, every single returning character is between two and three years older. For this to work, their birthdays would need to line up properly, and the tournament would have had to have taken place at a different time of year compared to what it had previously been. None of which is too unbelievable, it's a bit of a stretch, but that doesn't break the logic in any sort of way. But that still doesn't explain Marcus. Well, I don't know, given the fact that Marcus in this interpretation is just a complete nutjob as opposed to the split personality of Needles, I'm almost convinced that this is not even supposed to be the same person. This is especially apparent when you notice Sweet Tooth's age. Twisted Metal 3 is the only time they ever say how old Needles is, and in this case he's 42, whereas Marcus is 36. There you go. I'm gonna do a mental handspring backflip and say this isn't the same Marcus Kane, or at the very least, when Calypso created this timeline, he completely altered who Marcus Kane even is. So maybe he's like a brother of Needles or something. So, with that out of the way, I choose to place this game in 2008. Or do I? because Twisted Metal 4 is going to be the game that throws that all into question. <laughs> 
Twisted Metal 4 is what I believe to be the final game in the entire series continuity, because even if another game comes out in the future, this is the game that I believe has to end the entire timeline, and I will explain why in a moment. So as you'll probably know, the story of this game is about Sweet Tooth and his merry band of clowns staging a coup to take the tournament from Calypso, specifically stealing the ring that gives him his power. Now, this is of course a retcon because the source of Calypso's power has shifted over time. First it was a demon from hell named Black, then it was a gift from Satan himself, and now this. It's one of those things you kinda just have to accept. It's worth it to suspend your disbelief for things like this if you want to make something like this make any sense. Otherwise, what's even the point? So now Sweet Tooth is running the tournament and Calypso is a contestant for the first time. Also, it's worth noting that in 2012, 3, and 4, Calypso has maintained the Weird Al Yankovic by way of Morticia Adams look. So now the question is, when does this game take place? Well, this is where things get sticky. Since there are very few returning characters and the ones who are returning don't have a specific age, we have to jump through some mental hoops. Our first point that we can narrow this down is with General Warthog, who said he enlisted in the army in World War I at the age of 19. Now he's 99, meaning it's been 80 years since he enlisted, and as we know, World War I lasted from 1914 to 1918. So doing a bit of math, we can narrow this game down as taking place sometime between... Oh dear, that does not line up with my timeline at all. Then again, my assumption that the previous game took place in 2008 was just that, an assumption. So maybe there's more hard evidence to point this game to having a definitive placement that Twisted Metal 3 had to align with and not the other way around. But that leaves me kind of stumped on when the main game takes place. I thought I hit a eureka moment when I found the wiki saying that Rob Zombie is 55, but I had the urge to check to see when that revision was made, and sure enough, it was made in 2020, when Rob Zombie would have been 55 in real life, meaning this edit was made in relation to Rob Zombie's actual age, not the age in the game. Okay, I do have one more thing to check, but it's incredibly iffy. During the game's intro, there's a newspaper headline when Calypso gets thrown from his tower but I can't read this. Though maybe there's a single frame that's clear enough that I can read it. Maybe if we just go back a few frames. There we go. It's a little bit smeared, but I think that says May 10th, but that's not the important part. The real important part is that that definitely says 1999. So there we go. This game does in fact take place in 1999, and actually that does work because if the army general enlisted in 1918, that means he would have been 99 in 1999. Okay, well, he'd be turning 100, but he'd be starting the year at 99. Man, I feel like such a sleuth right now. So hold up. They put all the effort into making the ages of the characters roughly line up between Twisted Metal 2 and 3, but did it bother to make note of what year these games take place? I know these games aren't canon to each other now, but they were at one time. Okay, well, I guess I'll retract my statements about Twisted Metal 3 taking place in 2008, but, you know, if the fourth game is supposed to take place in 1999, the same year it was released, that presumably is also the same for the third game as well. That was probably the thought process going in, and I don't have any evidence to the contrary, so I guess it takes place in 1998. So I was only off by 10 years initially. That's not bad. So you may be asking at this point, why is Twisted Metal 4 the end of the timeline? Well, aside from the whole thing about the trophy showcase, I think Calypso's ending in Twisted Metal 4 comes across as the definitive ending for the entire series in any timeline. Why is that? Well, Calypso and Sweet Tooth tussle for the ring, and they cause a massive explosion, and I think when that kid picks up the ring, we see them inside the ring still fighting later on. Here's what I think happened. When the explosion happened, I think the souls of Calypso and Needles both went inside the ring, just like all the other souls that Calypso absorbed. So essentially their souls are forever trapped inside the ring, fighting a perpetual battle that neither can ever win. I think that's about as definitive an ending as you could possibly get, so that's why I placed this as the series conclusion. Of course, a new game could eventually come along and contradict all of this, but for right now, that's how I interpret this timeline. Meaning that the timeline looks a little something like this. 
And that's where we close off. Man, I gotta say, I had a blast making this video. My original timeline video was kind of a pragmatic thing. A lot of this game goes after this game and takes place on this year because that's how the developers intended the order to be. But now that I'm more knowledgeable on the franchise, this has given me a chance to really delve into the nitty gritty and investigate the fine details. Details that were probably unintended by the developers, but details that helped me make sense of something that really shouldn't make sense. Examining the small details and being a sleuth is genuinely fun, and I genuinely enjoyed going on this investigation. So with that, I want to thank you all for watching, and if you enjoy hearing the sound of my voice, please consider pledging to my Patreon for unique rewards like these fine folks right here. And an extra special thank you to users FarmCat84 and GAW004 for going above and beyond. I know I already shouted out my Patreon at the beginning of the video, but this is basically just my routine at this point. Elsewise, you can support the channel by liking this video, leaving a comment telling me what you think, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon so you're always up to date on what I'm doing. I've been the King of Snark Style right here on Tactical Bacon Productions, and I will see you next time. Peace!